I'm still digesting the loss that Klal Yisrael lost this morning when we lost Reb Zechariah Wallerstein, Zechit Tzadik Lebracha. I'm not in the mindset to be able to really think of what to say. At this moment, I'm still in the process of Ayidon Aharon. Because when you get hit with such a devastating loss, a loss that literally shook the entire American Jewry, he reached people all over the world. It's something that you got to stop and think. I don't think we appreciated what we had until we no longer had it. And now the stories are going to start coming out. Now we're going to start to understand what Klal Yisrael had in Reb Zechariah Wallerstein, Zechit Tzadik Lebracha. I just want to say one comment though, and then we'll pick this up on a future date when we're able to digest a little bit more what it is that we had, let alone what we lost. You know, a little over a month ago, we lost the Gadol Hador, the great Ruhaim Chaim Kanievsky, Zechit Tzadik Lebracha. Part of the devastation of that loss was not only the Shmira of the Torah, that he was Shomer the entire Klal Yisrael. And it's very evident, the moment we lost him, how many tragedies, how much tsarot, how many attacks in Israel alone that took place right, as, right after we lost Reb Chaim and all over the world. The Jewish people have not had an easy time after the loss of our great Gadol. But there's another point, and that is that when we lost from Chaim Kanievsky, the bar, the bar of the greatness of Torah dropped. We once had somebody to look up to, somebody from our generation that you could walk into his room and you could talk to him. You could ask him questions. You can get a bit of from him. You could simply stand and bask in the presence of his light. And that already would be enough. When I took my son to Reb Chaim Kanievsky, I told him, look at him. You don't even have to talk to him. Just walk into the room and stand in his Dalet Amot and just look at his face. Look at the glow. Look at the Shekhinah. For that alone, you walk out a different person. That your eyes should simply see what God looked like. You have a dogma that you're able to look at someone and say, I saw him in my lifetime. I saw God look. I saw greatness. I saw Reb Chaim Kanievsky. This past Cholam I asked my son, uh, you have a few days off. This year, Cholamoyed was a good one. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Th- it was that classical one. The one that people wait for. <laughs> you know, the people that they like to travel. This was the perfect one. I asked my son, what do you want to do this year, Cholamoyed? He says to me, Abba, I want to go to Eretz Israel." I said, really? Wow. For those three days? He says, yeah. I want to do one of those... Uh, Rabbi Dubi backpack trips. You know, we hit the ground running, no sleeping. We would go straight up to Tveria, Rameir Balanes, Vatikim by Rabbi Akiva's Kever, the Ramchal. On the way back, breakfast with the Rambam. On the way up to the Tzvat, jump into the Arizal's Mikveh. From there to the Rajbi, Amuka, Abaye Verava. Make our way. Oh, Abba, that's the trip I want. I said, wow, okay. We made a believer out of you. And that's what we did. We, we, we bought tickets, my son and I, alone. Motzei Yom Tov, we were on a flight, Sunday night. We're on a flight. We landed Monday, Cholam in Israel. Jumped into a little Toyota Yaris. You know, those little, <laughs> Israel special, you know. <laughs> and we were straight up north. And we did just that. Our beat by Reb Meir, Vatikim by Rabbi Akiva, breakfast with the Rambam. Made, the Shalak, Kadosh, made our way up to Tzvat. I threw him in the ocean, not the ocean, I threw him in the Mikveh of the Arizal. 
My son, I said, <laughs> I know it's freezing, but give me another one. I know it's freezing. Come on, give me another one. Go down again. And he, 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 he roughed it. He roughed it. We didn't go to cemeteries because it was Chol HaMoed, but we went to Kivret Sadikim. That's what my Rebbe Rabbi, Rabbi Novich told me that we we're able to do. And that's what we did without entering any cemeteries. We just went to Kivret Sadikim. So we went to the Mikveh, and then we went to Amuka, and then we went to Abayi Varava. And from there we went back to the Rajbi. And on our way back, we're going back to Jerusalem, we pass B'nai Brak. And we stop him. And without entering the cemetery, Reb Chaim is buried at the corner, right at the beginning of the Shvil, right at the beginning of the path. You don't have to enter the cemetery. He's right there at the beginning of the path, right next to the Rebetzin. And I couldn't believe it. I looked down on the floor and there is the uh, small mazkere. I'm not even going to call it matseva. It's not a stone yet. There is no stone. There is no stone. It's only in 30 days. But there was a mazkere that said, Hagoyen Hatzadik, Reb Shmaryo, Yosef, Haim, Ben. They are on the floor flat. I couldn't believe it. I turned to my son and I said, would you believe that this past January, we were standing in front of him. We went to him. We got bit of hook from him. It wasn't easy. It was very hard for him to pick up his, his head. He was so weak. But we were standing by him. And now we're standing alongside him. Now it broke my heart. We had somebody to look to and say, I saw in my lifetime, a true Gadol HaTorah. Gadol BaTorah Amiti. The real deal. Someone who finished the entire Torah every year. He made a siyum on Erev Pesach. Every year, the entire Torah. Babli, Yushami, Rambam, Sifri, Sifra, Zohar. I mean, you name it. And he finished it every year. And he made a siyum, Erev Pesach. This year was a leap year. So he was running a month early, a month ahead of time. So instead of finishing on the 15th of Nisan, he was able to finish on the 15th of Adar, the day he passed away. Adar Ben, it was an extra month. Yeah. So he had an extra month. <clears throat> he had an extra month. And to, to tell yourself that we had someone that great, he was the bar of what we in our generation can think. How great could Torah be? We looked up to him because he was the measuring stick. He was the bar. When we lost him, we lost our proportion of the greatness of what Torah could be. Who are we gonna show our children a giant of Torah in our days of that magnitude? That magnitude. We lost Ham Ovadia. We lost Ham Ben Siona Bar Shaul. We lost We lost the giants, the stipler. We lost, we lost it. And Reb Chaim was the last of that group. He was the bar of Torah greatness that we were able to measure and demonstrate and say, wow, look what a Jew can be when it comes to Torah. Look what he reached. Look what we should aspire to try to at least get greatness out of ourselves. Maybe not to that height. We could maybe not be Reb Chaim Kanievsky, but we could be us. We could be our own gadlut of what Torah was meant to be for us by taking the example of gadlut of what Torah was meant to him. And we lost him. And we lost the measure of greatness of Torah. Today, we lost another bar maker. We lost somebody. Rabbi Zechariah Shimon HaKohen Mimishpachat Wallerstein Zechet Tzadik Lebracha. We lost somebody that was the bar of Kiruv in America and maybe in Klaus. He set that bar. He did. People don't really realize this, not yet. But 
I know because I ran around a little bit with him and watched him. And boy, did he get it. And boy, did he love people. Did he love Klaalisle? And by him, there was no bias. It made no difference what your last name was. It made no difference what community you came from. It made no difference what type of passport you held in your back pocket. He loved you because you were a Jew. And it didn't matter a boy, girl, on derech, off derech. Yes, Shomer Shabbat, no Shomer Shabbat. Black kippah, white kippah, no kippah. It made no difference to him. He gave his heart and soul to every Jew that met him and that he met. He gave his life for Kali, sir. Simply put, but more than that, Rabotai, I want to explain to you what I'm trying to compare. He was the bar of Kiruv in Kali, sir. When he started his Avinu Malkenu organization, when he started Ornava, when he started everything that he's done for Klal Yisrael, it was always with the idea of what he can deliver for Klal Yisrael. And it's amazing to me. Now, if you think about it, he was able to reach levels to inspire people all over the world. Not everyone gets a zechut. Not everyone does Shamayim give the zechut to be lucky enough to have the microphone to speak to the world. And he was Zohet to that. And when we lost him, we lost the bar of those great Kiruv people of Klavisra. The ones that went out and did whatever they had to do. Harofeh Lishbure Lev. That's who we lost today. He was the doctor that knew how to heal the brokenhearted of Klav Yisra. The great Reb Zechariah Wallerstein. Zechet Tzadik Lebracha. I can't even believe I'm saying Zechet Tzadik Lebracha. I'm so young. I'm so young. Ah. How do you make up a guy like that? How do you make up? How do you make up a guy like that? And what he did for Klav Yisra, how do you make that up? The bar just dropped. The people out there chasing Hashem's children because they cared enough. From two o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon. We just lost the symbol of that champion, that Gibor Hayel, Gibor Hayel, that went out to fight for the cause of Hashem. You can't make up a person like this. But we got to try our best to start caring a little bit more for other people in Claudius, to take at least a lesson from him. He cared enough. When he saw people broken, it bothered him. He couldn't sleep when other parents couldn't sleep. He couldn't deal. He felt obligated that when someone called him and cried to him, he felt obligated to that child as if it was his own. Do you understand what it means to lose sleep over somebody else's problems? Do you understand what it means to lose sleep or to drop tears on a pillow because of someone else's child? That was Reb Zechari. It was like what they said on Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu simply put, Vayigdal Hayeled. You know what the Gadlut of Vayigdal Hayeled? You know what the Gadlut of Moshe Rabbeinu was? That he went out and he saw the pain of his brothers. That is a recipe for Gadlut. That was Reb Zechari. He saw the pain of Klal Yisrael and he reacted. He opened a high school for girls. He opened a seminary for girls. He built this famous ranch for those who really needed special help. And he provided it. And he did it with heart and soul. He was the bar of Kiruv in Klaus. And the minute we lost him, that bar dropped. Who's going to chase after Hashem's kids?
I want to speak about a class tonight that I believe was an incredible koach of Reb Zechariah Wallenstein, Zechat Tzadik Bracha, to take the brokenhearted and heal, to take the troubles of Klal Yisrael and turn them into happiness, to take broken families and make them families that were male beracha. That's a special power, special gift. He told me once, and I've heard this again and again on different classes that he's given, his Rebbe, Reb Gamliel Rabinovich, would tell him, your name is Zechariah Shimon. Zechariah was the Navi of his time. The Navi, the Navi by the Chorba. Zechariah, he told him, Zechariah, you're going to be the one in this generation, similar to the Nevi'im, that it could call out, could it call out to the entire generation, Bahadracha, Avodat HaKodesh. But you're going to be Shimon, Milashon Shemi'ah. They're going to hear you. You're going to be Zechariah, the one that's delivering God's message, but also Shimon. They're going to hear it from you. They're going to accept it from you. You're going to be gifted to give it over in a way that they'll be willing to listen. That's a gift. That's not something that everyone gets. Special siyata dishmaya. To be given the message to give out and to be listened to. That's a special gift. So let me talk about this idea. I want to talk to you about this incredible idea of Svirat Omer. And many of the Marmakomot that I'm about to bring to you now were brought from a Shi'ur a Shmuz of Yedid Nafshi, Rabbi Gladstein Shalita, Shem Shem Blessim, Ba'ri Chut Yamim Shanim, somebody very special who continues to help Klal Yisrael with incredible research, magnificent Shi'urim, Shem Shem Blessim. I want to introduce to you this, this incredible idea, incredible idea. Jack, a half a shield or for what? No, that's it. I don't see what you're going to gain. Okay, here we go. You look after me. Okay, where's that? Dish? Let's do it. Politics <laughs> is a spark. That's it. Let's see. You never know. Every word is a spark. Every word. We're holding the days of Svirat Omer, which happen to be days of Avelu. Take a look at us. We're not listening to music. We're holding a days, no haircuts. We're holding a days literally of Avelut. We all know that the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva passed away in these days. And we're mourning for them. 24,000 giants of Torah study. And we're still crying for them years later. This is an amazing idea. You know, so many great Sadiqim passed away over the years. But Klaisol doesn't go into Avelu over their loss. But on the 24,000 of Rabbi Akiva students, the entire Jewish people are sitting Avelu for 30, some odd, 33 days. Why is that? Tonight I want to tell you a little bit of a, a secret, something a little bit on the higher levels of looking at the story behind the story of the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. The Megale Amukot is Megale to us. And so too, found in the works of the Ramah Mipano, the Italian Svaradi Mekubal, in his Sefer Gilgule Nishamot, he writes that these 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva actually were the Gilgulim of the 24,000 that died from Shevet Shimon in the story of Zimri, Cosby, and Pinchas. Now, if I can bring you back for a moment to that story, we all remember Jewish people were coming through the desert. Balak, Melech Moab, he hears that the Jewish people are coming close. He gets all paranoid, worried, and nervous. 
And he decides that he's going to attack us. He hires a mercenary, a spiritual mercenary, Bilam. And he tells Bilam he'll pay him a whole house full of gold and silver to go and destroy the Jewish people, curse them and wipe them out. We know that Bilam goes and tries. He knew, says the Gemara Berachot, that secret moment in early morning, the rega of Zam, that moment that God gets angry. And he knew that there's a secret about that moment. If you were to curse anyone at that moment of anger, the moment that God gets angry, the curse hits and you can literally create a holocaust. And this is what he wanted to do. So Bilam that morning comes to the Jewish people and he sets his eyes on the people. It's as if a sniper that set his scope on his target. And at that moment he waits for the moment that rega of Zaam, the moment that God's going to get angry. And at that moment he's ready to curse. He had that evil eye, the eye of Bilam. And Chazal tells us, as the Gemara says in Berachot, that that morning, out of the love for the Jewish people, Abba, <laughs> Avinu Shabbat Shabbat, at that morning, Borei Olam decided not to get angry at all. And Bilam had nothing to work with. It was like a sniper who pulls the trigger and it jams and no bullet comes out. There was nothing to, there was no anger. Hashem that morning did not get angry. And because of that, Bil'am realizes that these are the beloved people of God. And instead of cursing, he realized that it would be a great favor in the eyes of God. He gives a blessing instead. Matovu ohalecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Yisrael. He gives incredible blessings to the Jewish people. This is the story that we know. It's the story of Parashat, Balak, Bil'am, amazing story. The moment that God saved us, again. But just when you thought that that was the end of the story, the Gemara tells us something frightening. The Gemara tells us that Bil'am, although he gave us blessings, it's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, Kufhe Amulbet, the Gemara says, that later on, he took all his blessings and he flipped them into curses. How? By giving the etzah to Balak to send out the daughters of Ammon and Moab and to bring the, the men of Klal Yisrael, God forbid, to Zenut. And by getting them to fall to the daughters of Moab, Midian, that was going to flip all the blessings, God forbid, to curses. That's what the Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin, Kufhe Amubet. Ah, amazing. Now, at that minute, we know the story that Zimri, who was the head of the tribe of Shimon, he goes and he takes the daughter, the princess, by the name of Cosby. By the way, her name really wasn't Cosby. It was uh, Shlumiel or something like that. But they called her Cosby, meaning Lashon Kazab. If you speak a little Arabic, you know Kazab is, a, is, a, is a, a very bad liar. Not just a liar, a bad liar. Cosby, Milashon Kazab, liar. She lied to her father. She told her father that she was going to go after Moshe Rabbeinu. But she couldn't go near Moshe Rabbeinu, Isha Elohim. So she ended up going after the next of the greats down. She ended up going after Zimri, the head of the tribe of Shimon. And Zimri comes to marry her. And Shevet Shimon creates a fortitude around the wedding of Zimri and this Kazab and this woman, Cosby. And they don't let anybody in. And he goes, and the Gemara tells us he was Boel Har 424 times. The Gemara says something incredible. This is a Gemara that is beyond words. 
And it's a Gemara that Bezat Hashem I'd like to come back to. The Gemara in Sanhedrin, Pebet Amubet. The Gemara says over there that when Pinchas came in to kill Zimri and the Goya, Cosby, he had to wait until Zimri got weak and then he killed the two of them. He brought the Romah. He, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for the detail, but he shishkabob them. Brought them out and announced anybody that continues with the Zenu of what's going on is going to end up like this. Forgive me for the detail. I know it's not exactly appropriate. But that was the moment that the Magia find it. That was the moment that Pinchas stood for the honor of God. That was the moment that God said, Pinchas, you stood for my breed. You were the one that brought back the honor of God to Klal Yisrael at this terrible moment of Zenut. Because of that, Biriti Kehuna, God gave him this unbelievable convenant of Kehuna. Later on, Pinchas to become none other than Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu Hanavi. Zu Pinchas. Amazing. What a story. But at the time, while this terrible story was going on, and while the terrible Zenut was happening in Klal Yisrael, Al Yedeid Benot Midyanu Moav, 24,000 from the tribe of Shimon died in Magifa. 24,000. Says the Ramami Pano, those 24,000 from the tribe of Shimon, the tribe of Zimri, they came back as the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. And if we are to push the envelope, says the Ramami Pano, the Megali Amukot goes to this as well. Not only these 24,000 came back as the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, but Rabbi Akiva himself came back as the Gilgul of Zimri. Wow. Amazing. <clears throat> so we got Zimri with 24,000 in his tribe coming back round two as Rabbi Akiva and 24,000 students. 24,000? 24,000. Rabbi Akiva, Zimri. And the great question is, Zimri died. Wait, 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 wait. So let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. But the great question is, these 24,000, what connection do they have to the 24,000 of the tribe of Shimon? You know, when you come back again, you come back to be metaken, what was wronged in the last round. You come to fix what wasn't done right in the previous round. That's the whole point of a gilgul nishama. Give him another chance to be metaken and to fix. What is it that we see in the 24,000 of the students of Rabbi Akiva that had any connection at all to the 24,000 of the tribe of Shimon with Zimri. What does one have to do with the other? And yet we know that in these days we're sitting in Avelut because these 24,000 students died and there's only one reason that the Gemara gives why they died. They did not show respect one to another. What does it have to do with the 24,000 of the tribe of Shimon? The tribe of Shimon had nothing to do with respect, kavod. It had to do with zenut. And yet, they're coming back as the 24,000 Rabbi Akiva, which they stumbled when it came to ben adam chavero, kavod zelazeh. What does these 24,000 have to do with these 24,000? Tonight, we're going to find out a completely new story, a sod, an amazing idea, an idea that's written up by Ramosh Shmuel Shapiro, in his Sefer Afik Emayim, we're going to speak about the idea that was brought to us by the incredible Sefer, the Imre Yosef, as Rabbi Glastin brings it. And this is something that I think we got to start from the beginning and realize that there's a bigger story here that we're missing. And this is a question, I'll be honest, that bothered me for many years. 
Why did Moab attack us? Think about this. We are traveling through the desert. Are we bothering anybody? Did we attack them? Kali Yisrael didn't attack anybody. We were simply looking for safe passage to go through the desert. We had enough issues in Mitzrayim. We finally get out as free men. We're walking with God. We got the Torah. We're walking now on our way to Israel to go into Eretz Yisrael. The game plan was to come to Eretz Yisrael, build the Beta Bechira, build the Beta Migdash, and be able to sit and worship Hashem in our land. That's all we wanted. We didn't bother anyone. We were going through the desert enveloped in Anani HaKavot. We had in front of us the Ananim, behind us Anani HaKavot. We had the Man dropping, the Be'er Miriam following. We were amongst the giants, Moshe, Aharon, Miriam. We weren't bothering anyone. The truth is, this is the story of Jews in all generations. <laughs> we, we never wanted to bother anybody. We just wanted to be left alone. Just leave us alone. Let us worship God. Let us do our thing. Even Jews in Galut, we bounced from country to country as we were being expelled, as we were being thrown out, blood libels, persecution. And all we wanted to just sit and live in peace. This is an old Jewish tale. And here we are going through the Midbar. All of a sudden, Balak, the king of Moab, hears that the Jewish nation is passing right by his nation. He gets all alarmed. He gets all paranoid. It's as if we were coming after him. It's as if he thought we would attack him. Why would he think that? What, what, why, why was he threatened by a Jewish people? What did we ever do wrong to the guy? And yet, Balak was so worried about the Jewish people passing by that he said to himself, I got to attack them first. Balak, did we ever wrong you in a different lifetime? What's the problem? Why are you attacking us? What did we do to you? Rabotai, there's a piece to the puzzle that we're missing. A very big piece. And if you don't know this piece to the puzzle, we didn't begin to figure out the behind the scenes wealth and opportunity of Sfirat HaOmen. We're in a period now of the year that is much bigger than what's given credit to. And the reason is because there's very little that we know about this story. Let me tell you the story behind the story. Do you know where Moab comes from? Well, Very good. And that's the secret. <laughs> you see, once upon a time, there was a man by the name of Lot, who originally, together with the great Abraham Avinu, later on, they part ways. Lot goes to Sidon. Lot is one of the uh, government officials, the governor of the city of Sidon. It turns out, that Lot was saved in the honor and the merit of Abraham Avinu. After the angels bring Lot out, together with his daughters and his wife, his wife doesn't make it. She was told not to look back, and she became, as we know, that Tel Shalmelah, a pillar of salt. He finally makes it out with his two daughters, and they're hiding in a cave, and writes to Midrash that they honestly thought, not just Sidon, not just Amora, not just the neighboring cities. They thought the entire world was destroyed. They thought that the only man left on planet Earth was their father, Lot. And that night, they did an act that was, in certain ways, L'Shem Shamayim, in, in a very, but an unthinkable act. And they got their father drunk, and they cohabitated, and they both became pregnant. And they became the mothers of the nations of Ammon and Moab. Lot, says Chazal, is milashon latuta. Latuta is a curse. 
Light, Rabbi Hizda, says the Gemara in Berachot. Light, Rabbi Hizda. Rabbi Hizda cursed somebody that didn't wash their hands before they went to eat bread. Light. Light is milashon lot. Latuta, a curse. From Lot came Latuta, a cursed offspring. An offspring that came through a very despicable style of cohabitation. An unthinkable act. A father with daughters. Oh. And with that, the nations, Amon and Moab, says the Pasuk in Tehillim, Matsati David Avdi. Efo Matsata David Avdi. Very good. Where was the Nitzotz? The spark of the Neshama of Melech HaMashiach, the Davidic line, David HaMelech. Where did David originate from? Moab. Moab. Root. From Lot. And therefore, for some reason, Boreolam decided to hide the spark of David HaMelech, Melech HaMashiach, in the land of Moab. In the land of Moab. Amazing. And there's a good reason for this. We once gave a class that every step of the way, bringing about Melech HaMashiach to the world, was always in the last place you would expect to find him. We had that talk when we spoke about the story of Yehuda mm -hmm. and Tamar. The last place you would expect the Melech HaMashiach to originate from would be from such a story that's very difficult to understand the depths of that story. The last place you would expect Melech HaMashiach to come from is from Latuta, Klala, Lot, Lait, from an act of such a despicable origin. Moab, the land of Moab was the land of terrible immorality. You expect to find the Nitzots of the Nishama of David HaMelech there in such a despicable, immoral society? Yes, that's where he was hidden so that the Yitzhahara never knows where he could find the Nitzots of Mashiach so as not to sabotage the coming of Mashiach in Klau Yisrael. Hashem always hid him in the last place you would expect. Root, a girl from Moab, who would ever think that she would be the great-grandmother of David HaMelech, Melech HaMashiach. But Melech HaMashiach is always brought through the back door from a place you would never expect. Do you know who knew the secret? Balak, the king of Moab. Balak knew that his people of Moab were the power source of the Tum'ah in the world. Moab is Gematria 49. Moab held the power of 49 levels of Tum'ah. That's all 49. What was the battery that powered up the power behind the 49 levels of Tum'ah? The Nitzots of David. As long as Moab held on to the Nitzots of the Neshama of David HaMelech, that literally powered all their 49 levels of Tumah. That gave them the power source to be able to be the despicable nation of Moab and all 49 levels of Tumah. You see, because this is the way Tumah works, gentlemen. Tumah does not have its own koach. Tum'ah does not have its own battery. Tum'ah is like a leech. Tum'ah is a parasite. It sucks off of other living things in order for it to continue to exist. The same thing is true when it comes to Tum'ah. Tum'ah cannot exist by itself. Tum'ah has to parasite and leech its way off of dead nitzotzot, or other smaller Nitzot Sot of Kedusha, and it sucks and leeches its way off of that power for it to continue to exist. Know this. 
Tuma cannot exist without Kedusha. It piggybacks on the Kedusha and it literally steals like a leech. It's a bloodsucker. It sucks out the blood and power to be able for it to continue to exist. Moab's 49 levels of Tuma power was a result of it parasiting off of the Nitzots of David HaMelech that was amongst them. And you know who knew this? The king, Balak. He knew this. And when he heard that the Jewish people are passing the nation of Moab, right away he went into paranoia zone. They're coming for us! They're coming to get the Nitzots of David HaMelech from amongst us. And if they take our power source, our battery away, we're finished. Says Balak, I'm going to have no kingdom, no kingdom, no power, no people. Klum. This is a world war. They're coming for us. And that's why he was so threatened. But what do you mean? We were walking, <laughs> we were walking by. We, we weren't bothering anybody. Says Balak, no, no, no. I know what your people are after. I know that you know, that I know, that you know, that I know that I have something that belongs to to you. And I know you're coming to get it. Because it says Balak, I know this is the plan. I know the plan of your God is to take you out of Egypt. Shamu Amimir Gazun. Take you out of Egypt. Shake up the world. Make Kriya El Suf. Give you the Torah. And then I know that the plan is you're going to come to pick up the Nitzots of your Mashiach. Enter Israel and have Mashiach build the Bet HaMikdash. Game over. I know that was your plan. And I know that you know that I got it. So the minute he heard the Jews were coming, automatically, what did he think? Paranoia, they're coming. They're coming for me. They're coming for me. They're coming to get the Nitzots of David HaMelech that's amongst us. The power source of the 49 levels to Moab, of Moab. Moab Gematria 49. And because of that, he said, Habal horgecha, hashkeb lahargo. You're coming to kill me? I'm going to kill you first. And that's why he went out to get Bilam quickly. And he said, wipe them out! Because they're coming for me. They're coming for my nation. They're coming for the nitzots of David HaMelech. And the truth of the matter is, he wasn't so wrong. Because that's exactly what Zimri was thinking. So I want to tell you something. Please open your hearts. The tribe of Shimon were always the tribe that protected the Kedushah of the Jewish people. The tribe of Shimon, when Dina, their sister, was taken and abused, in the story of Shechem ben Chamor, all the other brothers stood aside, except Shimon ben Levi. They stood up to protect the honor of the Kiddusha of our women and the Kiddusha of the Jewish people. Ki nevala asa bi Israel, says the Pasuk. In the concept of Israel, which is the concept of the Jewish people's purity, untainted, untouched, they were the guardians. The tribe of Shimon, guys, the guardians of the Kedushah of Am Yisrael. How from all the tribes would they be the ones to fall for the Zenut of Benot Midian and Moab? It doesn't make sense. It's against their MO. It's against their whole mantra. It has to be that there was something bigger here going on. We missed something. And the answer is we, we, we missed a lot. We have to be done with Kav Zichud Zimri. If he was the number two or number three man in Klal Yisrael in greatness at that time, it's because he was in the league of Moshe Aharon. He was number two, number three. Do you think someone of that magnitude would go and take a girl, Cosby? What was he thinking? Of course he made a mistake. 
But the question was, what was he thinking in the first place? Where was his head? What was his machava? You are the head of the tribe of the protectors of the Kiddushah of the Jewish people. You're the last guy in the world I would expect to go and take the princess of Moab, the princess of Midian, and go and take her as a wife. And the answer is, Zimri also knew the secret that the Nitzots of Melech HaMashiach of David is in Moab. And he said, Bil'am, you think you're going to get us to fall by sending out the Benot Midian Moav? You think you're going to get us to fall? Just the opposite. I'm going to turn the tables on you. I'm going to find the girl that's carrying the Nitzots of David HaMelech in her. I'm going to marry her and I'm going to draw out from her the Nitzots of David Melech Mashiach and bring it back to the Jewish people. And then we're going to enter Israel. And then we're going to have Melech Mashiach build the Bet HaMikdash and it's going to be the Bayit Ne'eman, a house that can never be destroyed. Zimri was on the page. Zimri had this reconnaissance mission. I'm going to find the Nitzots of David amongst the Benot Moab Midian and I'm going to bring it back to the Jewish people. Where's he hiding? Where are they hiding him? Says Zimri, if it's our royalty, the future of Malchut David, the Davidic line of the Jewish people, would only make sense that our royalty is hidden amongst their royalty. And therefore, who did he take? The princess. That's probably where the Nitzots of David is. Zimri went with a master plan to bring Mashiach. So says Moshe Shepher. So says the Imre Yosef in his Likutim on Parashat Pinchas. And that's what the Gemara means. The Gemara Sanhedrin Pebet Amur Bet says that when Zimri took the princess, he married her and he was Boel her 424 times. Is that, I mean, the, 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 can you take that Gemara at, at, on, on a Pashtut basis? Can you, can you take that Gemara and simply put? Says the Imre Yosef, no. 424 is Gematria Mashiach ben David. Wow. There's the secret. So when the Gemara tells you that he was Bohel Har 424 times, the Gemara's Miramez, what was he thinking? The head of the tribe of Shimon, the protectors of the Kiddushah of Israel, what were you thinking when you took this Goya? And the answer is 424. That's what he was thinking. He was thinking, Mashiach ben David. I'm going to cohabitate with her, take her as my wife, and from her I'm going to pull out the Nitzots of David HaMelech and have a child who's going to be that Nitzots back into Israel. And he is going to be that Melech HaMashiach. That was his Cheshbon. And the entire tribe was in on it with him. And they were all at the quest of finding the Nitzots and bringing it back so that we can bring back the Nitzots of Melech HaMashiach to Klal Yisrael where he belongs, no longer in Moab, knocking out the power source of the 49 levels of Tum'ah Moab by taking the battery out and bringing him back to us where he belongs bringing him into Israel to build Bet HaMikdash. This was the machshava of Zimri, says Rabbi Shushmo Shapiro, says the Imre Yosef. The problem was that when you act without Da'at Torah, you can have the greatest intentions and you can make an Egel. That's what happened by the Egel. They thought they were doing good. They thought they were going to build a new middleman between them and God. They never thought Avodah Zarah at first. But when you act without asking Dat Torah, you can with the best intentions make an Egel. In this case, without asking Moshe Rabbeinu, without asking Aharon, Zimri jumped. He did an act thinking that he's coming to save Mashiach, bring him back to Klal Yisrael, but you were going against the time. It's not the time yet. 
You can't force Mashiach in. You can't force the time of Mashiach. And because of that, it was a Maaseh Zenut, not a Maaseh Mashiach bringing. And that's what Pinchas came with the Romach. And he says, anyone that goes against Dat Torah, even with the greatest intentions, even though the whole tribe was trying to bring Mashiach, even though Zimri was trying to bring Mashiach, it's not the time. You cannot bring Mashiach without Da'at Torah. You can't be vigilante. And this was the secret of Otay. Why these 24,000 came back as the 24,000 of Rabbi Akiva. You see, because Rabbi Akiva, who came back as the Nitzotz Gilgul of Zimri, as told to us by Migale Amukot and the Ramah Mipano, Rabbi Akiva stood up and said, Arenu velo atta, Ashurenu velo karov, Darach kochav miyakov. Said Rabbi Akiva, Darach kochav miyakov, Kochav milashon bar kochba, Kochav milashon bar kochba. Rabbi Akiva announced to his generation, I know who Mashiach is. It's this man bar kochba. Darach kochav miyakov. Here we go. The story of Zimri. Take two. Zimri tried to bring Mashiach. Now Rabbi Akiva, a.k.a. Zimri, is going to try again to announce Bar kochba. Darach kochav miyakov. Kochav. Ze kochba. Ze Mashiach. At Kedekach, the Gemara tells us that Rabbi Akiva carried the towel of Bar Kochba to the Merchats because he's Malchut. He believed that he's Mashiach. So although Zimri wasn't able to bring Mashiach against the wrong time, comes back as Rabbi Akiva to now possibly bring Mashiach in the right time. And Rabbi Akiva's students were supposed to be Messiah to help now the bringing of Mashiach in the right time. Because in round one, these 24,000 were helping their leader bring Mashiach in the wrong time. Zimri! But now they came back, 24,000, to be mitaken and help Rabbi Akiva bring Mashiach in the right time. And Rabbi Akiva even pointed and announced who Mashiach is. Bar Kochba! Was Rabbi Akiva wrong? Rabbi Akiva, Gadol Ador. Rabbi Akiva, the one that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he looked and he saw Rabbi Akiva, he asked Borei Olam, says the Midrash, why did you give the Torah through me? You should have given the Torah through Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, the Rebbe of the Rajbi. Rabbi Akiva, the Rebbe that started over with five Talmidim and gave Torah back to the world. Was he wrong? Could you tell me he was wrong by telling us that Bar Kochba was Mashiach? Of course he wasn't wrong. So what's the problem? Why did we bring Mashiach? I told you who he is, says Rabbi Akiva. I told you his address, where he lives, his social security number, his last name. I told you everything you want to know about Mashiach. Why did he come? And the answer is because his students were supposed to help him to bring Mashiach this time. And if the reason for the Beit HaMikdash being destroyed was because Sinat Hinam, because Jews couldn't get along, these 24,000, instead of helping Rabbi Akiva bring Mashiach, ended up blocking Rabbi Akiva from bringing Mashiach to Klal Because if Klal Yisrael can't get along, if we can't get rid of the Sinat Hinam, if we can't show kavod zelaze, we cannot bring Mashiach. Even if you know his name, even if you know where he lives, even if you know his passport number and his social security number, you can't bring him if we can't fix the reason why we got into Galut in the first place. You can't get out if you can't fix 
the reason why you got in. And because they were shalom nahagu kavod zelazeh, they lost the opportunity to bring Mashiach with their rabbi. That's the secret of the Svirat Omer. 49 days. 49 days against the 49 levels of Tuma of Moav. Every day, the students of Rabbi Akiva and Svirat Omer was supposed to be mitaken another level of Tuma and flip it to Biracha. 49 days of Svirat Omer, 49 levels of Tuma of Moav. Remember, Moav is Gematria 49. Do you know what the antithesis of the Tuma of Moav 49? The 49 days of Svirat Omer. Every day in Svirat Omer, we have the opportunity to flip the Kilala of Moav to Biracha. For 49 days, we're knocking out the 49 levels of Tuma of Moav in order to get to the night of 50, the night that David HaMelech is born. You know why David is born on night 50? Because if you knock out 49 levels, Tuma of Moav, then they no longer could hold on to the Nitzots of David. And that's the 50th night. You knock them out completely, all 49 levels of Tuma. On night 50, David is born to Klal Yisrael. And that's the night that's Mesugal to bring Mashiach. The whole Sfirat Omer was 49 days that were meant to knock out 49 levels of Tuma Moav so that Mashiach could be born amongst us on the 50th night, the night that David was born. Shavuot. Shavuot. And because instead of bringing Mashiach, as long as Jews can't get along, even if we know who Mashiach is, what his name is, where he lives, and where he's from, it's not going to help until we bring him amongst us. And that's what these 49 days are about. It's amazing. And that's why we read Parashat Bechukotai right before Shavuot. Because Bechukotai has 49 kilalot in it. And after going through Svirat Omer, we're supposed to be flipping all 49 kilalot, the 49 berachot, so we can get to the night 50, when David, Melech HaMashiach, is born. That's what these days are supposed to be about. And that's why every day of Svirat Omer, 49 days, we're supposed to be work, working every day on another midah, on another midah, on another level, on another level, in order to finally fix the 49 levels. So that finally we can get to the 50th night, the night that David is born, the night that we can actually be Zoche to Melech HaMashiach. These people in our generation today, like Reb Zechariah Wallstein, Zechet Tzadik Lebracha, he loved people so much. He loved Klal Yisrael so much. He had a special affinity for the harofe lishbure lev, for the brokenhearted, for those that were really in sarot, down and out, and needed somebody to swoop down, swoop down and pick them up, and literally take out of their life that looks so klala, and flip it to such beracha. That's the avodah svirat omer. That's the days we're living in right now. If we could just find the kavod beinenu. And put things aside, like Rabbi Zachariah did, Zatzal. He loved no matter what neighborhood, what your last name was, Svaradi Ashkenazi. He had the children of Rabbanim. He had the children of Baalei Teshuvah. He had Svaradi, Hasidim, Litvish. It made no difference where you came from, what community. You called him for help, he came running. He built schools around the brokenhearted. And he fixed them. And he raised up what looked like Kilalo, and he flipped them to Berachot. That was the Avodav Svirata Omer. No wonder Borei Olam took him in these days. This was his life's work. This was his calling to take all the Kilalo and flip them to Berachot. If we could find in us the ability to find Kavod Zelazeh, we can get finally 
to that moment where 49 days could be flipped from the 49 of Moab, Klala, to the 49 of Biracha, Svirat HaOmer of Klal Yisrael. And on the 50th night, David HaMelech is born, and that's the moment that we could be Mekabel Pnei Moshe. Thank you for listening.